Earlier this year, Reddit user CS-NL posted this question to the internet. Reddit, my friends call me a scumbag because I automate my work when I was hired to do it manually. Am I? CSNL was hired to do manual data verification on rows and rows and rows of this giant Excel spreadsheet. He was working at this company where there was an entire department of people whose job it was to do this for eight hours a day and five days a week. And they were pretty good at it. The typical daily output was six to 10 records per day with about 90% accuracy. But CSNL knew some basic programming. So he wrote a computer program to literally do his entire job for him. The computer program that he wrote completed over 1,000 records a day with 99.6% accuracy. He replaced the entire department in a weekend. Now I know what you're thinking. All right, clever kid, stupid company. They should have just hired a computer programmer from the beginning because this data manipulation stuff is what computers were designed to do. But I want you all to think about the job that you all want to do one day. And I want you to imagine what it is that most people are doing when they're working there. Chances are it's a form of data manipulation. And it looks a lot like this. And if it hasn't already, it probably will be very soon. This has already happened to architects and doctors and architects, <laughs> um, and even weird things that no one would ever think uh, computers would even be involved with, like painters. And in a lot of ways, a lot of jobs have been completely replaced already by computers. People aren't even interacting with them at all. Did you know we used to hire people to, uh, to direct traffic? We would hire them to stand in the middle of traffic lanes and, and do this. We now have traffic lights. Um, we used to hire people to print out yesterday's news on pieces of paper and hand deliver it to us. <laughs> what? Um, we used to hire people to sit in a store and store multiple copies of videos on plastic and then rent them to us. And then they would charge us late fees if we didn't return them in time. Um, ridiculous. Um, and a lot of things that we're doing have not been solved. There's a lot of problems like this that don't make sense in an age of computers. Things like receipts and textbooks, which are just really heavy things of information that you can't search through and you can't look through them. And even classrooms, going to school. Why should I go to school when I can go on YouTube and I can fast forward through boring parts and rewind for more interesting parts? There's a lot of problems like this that don't make sense in an age of computers. So with this all in mind, I've come with a clear call to action, which is, ah, getting to it later. Um, but first, what can you do about it? Um, to answer this question, we need to go back in time to the year 1961, the year when uh, we decided to put a man in a rocket ship and sent him from Earth to the moon. Insane, any sane person would have told us back then. Um, but we did it. The problem was it would be impossible to navigate the system of rockets in real time if we were trying to do all the calculations by hand. So NASA engineers were very smart. They built the Apollo guidance computer, one of the most advanced computers of its day, to do all of these calculations for us. They did that with this. How many kids in the room have one of these right now? OK, that's awesome. That's like everybody. My mom's sitting up there. She had a rule when I was growing up that I couldn't have an iPhone until after it was invented. Um, <laughs> your smartphone in your pocket right now has the computing capability to do the calculations for one million Apollo 11s simultaneously. Now, I couldn't fit a million Apollo 11 little graphics on this slide, but if you can imagine this slide repeated this many times, and then this slide repeated this many times. That's how many Apollo 11s your cell phone can do the calculations for at the same time. NASA scientists in 1961 would have fallen to their knees and worshipped you like a god for having this kind of technology. And what are you using it to do? <laughs> There's a disconnect between the technology capability that you have at your disposal, the societal problems that we're facing, and what you know how to use the technology to do. So with this in mind, I've come with a clear call to action, which is that you should learn to program. And I have three reasons why. 
The first reason is quite simply that learning how to program makes you smarter. Now I know what you're all thinking. Why should I learn how to program? Aren't there people out there that will do this for me anyway? Well, yes, but that's the same argument that someone in the 1400s would have said about reading. Um, and now that you know how to read, isn't it really nice that you don't have to depend on someone else to do all of your reading for you? It's a really useful tool that we use to extend what our minds are currently capable of to problems that we're facing. And computers let you solve a lot of problems. As a programmer, if I have a problem of that I don't want to go to a video store, I can just make a website that streams video straight to my house. If I don't like libraries or textbooks because they're too heavy and they're too hard to search through, I can make an online encyclopedia that everyone can edit. Boom. Problem solved. If I think it's really awkward to ask someone if they're single, I can make a website where people just enter that information <laughs> and look it up. Um, a side effect of solving these problems is that sometimes you become a multi-billionaire. But <laughs> even if you don't invent the next Facebook, there are things that knowing how to program will teach you that you can use to do anything, like breaking up a really big problem into smaller pieces that you can understand, or iterating through things that you're building really fast so that you can make changes really quickly, or doing distributed version control where you can have a lot of people working on something simultaneously, or finding a little problem in a really big, complicated system called fixing bugs. Um, if nothing else, it just teaches you to stop listening to what a talking paperclip is telling you to do and to start doing things on the computer because you're actually understanding them. But most importantly, Knowing how to program will teach you how to use your computer's full potential. And this is only going to become more true as computers get faster and cheaper. Which brings me to my second point, which is that computers are growing faster than you are. There's this law in computer science called Moore's Law, which states that every two years, the computing uh, capability of a computer will double. How much smarter do you get every two years? Now, granted, you're still a lot smarter than a computer, but for how much longer? The futurist Ray Kurzweil estimates that by 2025, you'll be able to buy a computer with the computing capability of a human brain for $1,000. But what's even more amazing than that is stuff like this that you can buy today. This is the Raspberry Pi computer. It's a credit card sized computer that started shipping earlier this year for $25. $25 for a computer. Imagine what you could do with this if you knew what to do with this. <laughs> $25, you could practically throw these things away. You could hook one up to a laundry machine and have it text you when it's done doing laundry. Or you could hook it up to your toilet and have it congratulate you for a really long time for peeing. Um, I did that. It was awesome. Um, and I'll have, I'll have one of these during the break if you guys want to play with it. Um, it's not the same one. It's a different one. Um, but you wouldn't know what to do with it if I gave it to you, because this is what it looks like when you turn it on. Which brings me to my third and final point, which is that you're really lazy. <laughs> but what you don't realize is that computer programmers are some of the laziest people on the planet. <laughs> if there's a task that a computer programmer has to do that takes 10 seconds every day, a computer programmer will spend months building a tool that will shave five seconds off of that 10 seconds. But when you're first learning how to program, it's going to be really frustrating. You're going to be doing things like teaching the computer how to do math for you or teaching the computer how to type out words for you, things that you could do a lot faster if you just did it yourself. But you'll get to a point after a month, if you work on programming for about an hour a day, where it's actually faster for you to program the solution to something than it is for you to do it yourself. And it will open up this incredible world of potential. You will have the power to handle tons of data simultaneously. You'll have the creativity to build whatever it is that you want to build with no one telling you what the rules are or what you should be doing. You will be inspired to become a programmer. Don't. I want you to go back to whatever it was that you were thinking about doing before you started learning how to program. And I want you to bring back the tools that you've learned from programming. Just like if you learned how to read or write, you wouldn't have to become a writer. Or if you learned how to do math, you wouldn't have to become a mathematician. I want you to bring back these tools and rethink the places, the things that you want to do and the things that you want to change with these tools in mind. I'd like to end with a quote from someone who would have been a programmer if computers had existed when he was alive. Um, Henry Ford once said, if you have a difficult task to do, give it to a lazy man, and he will find an easier way to do it. Be lazy, be smart, and learn to program. Thank you.